Welcome to Physics Constraints in Games, Part 3, Soft Constraints. It is highly recommended that you watch Part 1 and Part 2 before continuing. My name is Alan Cho. You can find my other game dev tutorials on my website, alancho.net. I'm also active on GitHub, Twitter, and Patreon. My account is The Alan Cho. I also have a LinkedIn profile, Minglan Cho. First, let's look at the demo. Here, we're going to use physics constraint to constrain the blue cube's position to be the same as the position of the orange sphere. Here, we're going to use Baumgart stabilization, which we covered in previous tutorials with a beta term of 0.02. I'm going to drag the sphere around and you'll see that the cube is springing to the sphere's position. Now, I'm going to lower the beta value a little bit. And you can see now that the box is springing behind the sphere in the more relaxed fashion. I previously hinted that beta is kind of a magic number in that we just keep adjusting it until the results look good. The goal of this tutorial is to use parameter, parameters that are easier to understand and visualize and convert them to beta. Here you can see that the parameters have become frequency in hertz and in half-life in seconds. Frequency dictates how many oscillations occur within one second, and then half-life dictates how long the time is pa uh, has to pass before the uh, oscillation amplitude is cut in half. So here, frequency of 5 hertz means we're going to have 5 oscillations per second, and then half-life of 0.02 second means every 0.02 second, the oscillation amplitude is going to be cut in half. So this is what it looks like. Okay, so let's use some numbers that are easier to verify. We have a frequency of 1, that means every second is going to oscillate back and forth once. Half-life of 1, that means every one second the oscillation amplitude is, is going to be cut in half. So what does it look like? All right, now you can see the oscillation goes back and forth once every second, and then the amplitude is cut in half also every second. Here is the velocity constraint equation we previously derived with the Jacobian matrix multiplied with the velocity vector and then a positional error multiplied by the Baumgart stabilization term, beta over h, h is delta time. To achieve the springing effect we saw in the demo, we're going to introduce a new term, which is the force feedback. F is the force, correctional force, applied in the previous iteration of the solver. Gamma is the softness multiplied with the force. So the problem becomes how to use parameters that are easier to understand and turn them into beta and gamma to put into this equation. We're going to use a simple constraint for derivation and the results can, can be applied to other constraints. This constraint constrains the object to the origin using a spring. This is the corresponding differential equation, mass times acceleration plus d times velocity plus k times position equals zero. The parameters are d, the damping coefficient, and k, the spring constant. It's not very clear how d and k should be, I mean, how much d and k should be to achieve the desired oscillation frequency and amplitude decay. A common interpretation of this equation in code is in this form. Target value, which is the origin zero, minus current value, which is the position x, this is the position difference or position error. We multiply this with a spring fudge vector and add it to the velocity. And then we multiply the velocity with a damping fudge vector between 0 and 1. Finally, we multiply velocity with delta time and use it to integrate the position. But how do these two numbers work? How much should they be? Most people, or I mean, sorry, many people would just tweak it tweak the values until the results look good, but this is not what we want. We want parameters that make more sense. So we refactor this 
differential equation by dividing everything with mass to get this form. Now the coefficient for coefficient of acceleration is one, and the coefficients for velocity and position are expressed in two new parameters, zeta and omega. And here are their relationships with d and k. When expressed in this form, the parameters make more sense. Zeta is the damping ratio. Omega is the angular frequency. Here I am borrowing an illustration from Aaron Cotto's 2011 talk, Soft Constraints Reinventing the Spring. When damping ratio is set to zero, there is no amplitude decay, and the oscillation would go on forever, as illustrated by this magenta line, or magenta curve. And once we start increasing the damping ratio, the amplitude starts decaying, like this blue curve. There is still oscillation, but the amplitude is decaying. Once the damping ratio hits one, we call the system critically damped. The oscillation effect completely disappears. All that's left is an exponential decay, like this green curve. When we further, when we further increase zeta past one, we call the system overdamped. And the system is even now resisting the spring from returning the object to the origin, like this red curve. The position constraint equation is very simple. It's just x equals zero because we are constraining the object to the origin. And the corresponding velocity constraint looks like this. Here's the velocity plus bias, some bias terms equals zero. And here is the Baumgart stabilization term. Here is the force feedback term. Here is a quick overview of our goal. We want to start from parameters that make more sense, like the oscillation frequency and decay rate. Convert them to damping ratio and angular frequency. Then we're going to convert them to damping coefficient and spring constant. Finally, we convert them to beta, which is the error feedback factor for Baumgart stabilization, and then gamma, the force feedback factor, which is also sometimes called softness. Here is the differential equation expressed using zeta and omega, and here is the equation, same equation expressed using d and k. Here are the equations for integrating position and velocity using the implicit Euler method. You can see that the velocity is a little bit more complex than the uh, equation for position, but it's actually in the same form. It's uh, If we look at the position one first, it's new position equals old position plus delta time multiplied with the new velocity. So if we mirror that, the equation for velocity should be new ve velocity equals old velocity plus new acceleration multiplied by delta time and acceleration can be derived from here this is acceleration and we moved all these to the right of the equation and we multiply it by delta time which is h then we'll get this thing right here using kramer's rule we can express v2 in terms of d and k now, let's look at the velocity constraint equation and this set of three equations. The first one is the same one from implicit Euler. The second one is the, uh, applica uh, the equation for force application from Newtonian dynamics. New velocity equals old velocity plus force divided by mass multiplied with delta time. And the third one is just the velocity constraint equation with the new velocity plugged in. With some substitution, we can finally arrive at V2 expressed in terms of beta and gamma. So what are we doing here? We have V2 expressed in two different sets of parameters, and they seem to be in a similar form. So if we uh, highlight some of the terms like this, 
we, uh, we can see that the terms inside the rec red rectangles should be the same, and then the ones inside the green rectangles should be the same. So after moving things around, we can finally express beta and gamma in terms of d and k. So there we have it. Starting from zeta and omega, we can convert them to d and k, and then we can convert d and k into beta and omega. Let's move all the conversion equations to the left and look at the velocity constraint equation. The same equation in more familiar terms with Jacobian and lambda. Lambda is the correction impulse. The new velocity is going to be equal to the old velocity plus the correction done by the impulse. So it's lambda multiplied by the mass inverse matrix and Jacobian transpose. This was all derived from previous tutorials. So we can plug V2, the new velocity, back into the velocity constraint equation, and it would still hold. So now we can express lambda in terms of beta and gamma, along with everything else we derived earlier in previous tutorials. Here, E is an identity matrix that matches the uh, dimensions. Also mentioned in previous tutorials, we usually express this big inverse matrix as a single term, which is the effective mass matrix. Now let's look at some more higher level parameterization. First is the hard constraint. We actually saw this earlier in previous tutorials. If we don't want any softness or springiness in our constraint solution, we just set the positional correction vector beta to 1 and gamma, the softness, to zero. Next, let's look at the oscillation and half-life parameterization. We have f, the oscillation frequency in hertz, and then lambda, half-life, which is the time over which the, um, the oscillation amplitude is cut in half. The conversion from f to omega is easy. It's just by a factor of two pi radians. And from the differential equations for the spring constraints, we can derive that the, uh, the oscillation amplitude is decaying by this exponential factor, the Euler constant to the power of negative zeta omega t. t is the time elapsed, so when we plug in half-life lambda, this entire thing should be equal to half, which is 0.5. And after taking the natural log on both sides of the equation, we can express zeta in terms of omega and lambda. And then we go through the series of conversions we derived in this tutorial and arrive at the corresponding beta and gamma for the desired frequency and half-life. Finally, let's look at the special case for the oscillation plus half-life parameterization, which is the exponential decay plus half-life parameterization. We use this when we don't want any oscillation, we just want the exponential decay. So we only have one parameter, which is the half-life. Look at this illustration from before. We get critically damped curve, the green one, without any oscillation, just exponential decay, if we set the um, damping ratio to 1. So zeta is exactly 1, and from this equation we derived before, we can express omega in terms of half-life. And then we go through the same series of conversions to arrive at the corresponding beta and gamma. Now let's look at the demo again. Here we set the um, constraint mode to hard, which is beta equals 1 and gamma equals 0. So if we move the target around, we can see that the cube is tightly following the target. You can see a little bit lag and jitter because that's just how the Unity translation gizmos work. It's due to the update order. If we just directly update the coordinates here, you can see that there is no lagging. And then the cube is exactly following where the target goes. Next, let's look at soft half-life. So we set the oscillation frequency to 1 and then half-life to 1. We should expect the cube to oscillate around the sphere back and forth once every second and then the oscillation amplitude will decay by half every second. So 
So that seems about right. Finally, let's look at exponential decay. There should not be any oscillation and the half-life is 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. So you can see the distance between the sphere and the cube is cut in half every one second. That's it for this tutorial. You can find the source code for the demo and the slides on GitHub. If you like my game dev tutorials, please consider supporting me on Patreon. This talk uses Aaron Carlo's talk on self-constraints in 2011 as a reference. And here are more further readings on numeric experience on my blog. Thank you for watching.